Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 82, October 10th to October 16th, 1862. Last week, we talked mostly about the Second Battle of Corinth, which would end in disaster for the Confederacy and be another key victory in Grant's area of operation. This week, we need to set up the Battle of Perryville, which, in many ways, is the unsung battle of the Western theaters. Before we do that, though, we need to set things up. As a scheduling note, technically, Perryville happens last week on the 8th, but obviously, and I think you might agree that we can give it our full attention this week here, and it works a little bit better in this format. Before we really get going into the narrative, though, I do want to mention that we do have more Patreon content. Uh, This one's going to be another picture slideshow. I did some pictures from Antietam and tried to kind of mix it up and pick some pictures that have a real nice story attached to them. So it is not necessarily a narrative of that battle doesn't necessarily go in order, but I still think it is interesting to talk about some of the things, some of the images that I have posted on there. So if that sounds like something that interests you, then there is a link to the Patreon in the show description. And of course, as always, your contribution to the show is greatly appreciated. When last we left off, Bragg had captured Munfordville and Kirby Smith was still moving around, having won at Richmond in August. What the next target for the Confederate forces was would be debatable. Cincinnati and Louisville were both potentially on the menu, and until Buell arrives with his tired army marching hard to get there, they would be relatively open. It is entirely possible that Kirby Smith may even have been able to take one of those cities by himself, as it was occupied by new recruits from Indiana mostly, and various other militia units. Bragg, as mentioned, gave up the initiative by shifting his forces to go link up with Smith and his army. When Buell's men reached Louisville, most would be inactive due to drunken behavior. Kentucky and Indiana men would depart from the army to see family and friends. This is important to point out, and that leads to the undoing eventually of Bull Nelson. There are lots of Indiana recruits, but if you combine Munfordville and Richmond, there was not a lot of good press going on for these soldiers. Jefferson C. Davis was, of course, from Indiana, so there was already that beef with Bull Nelson. Davis was also seen as an officer firmly in the camp of Horatio Wright and Henry Halleck. Wright definitely was a Halleck man. He had parlayed his action during the Secessionville campaign into an appointment to organize the defense of Cincinnati. Bull Nelson was probably more in the category of being a Buell man, who, if you recall, was a rival for Halleck. So there's all kinds of officer politics going on amongst these soldiers. At one point, Thomas would be slated for the replacement of Buell, but George Thomas realized that he did not want to command the army, especially at the very point of crisis. Buell would stay for the time being. It is actually very interesting. George Thomas could have taken the army at a time when it would have been simply days before the Battle of Perryville. And it is interesting to ponder exactly how different the battle may have played out if Thomas had been in overall command. But speaking of the armies, let's talk about the makeup of both the Federal and the Confederate forces. For the Union, there were three corps that would make up Buell's army. George Thomas 
although having declined the command of the army, would still remain second only to Buell. The first corps would be commanded by Alexander McCook, the second by Thomas Crittenden, and the third by Charles Gilbert. We have already introduced McCook and Crittenden, but let's introduce Charles Gilbert. Charles Champion Gilbert was a career soldier, serving in the war with Mexico. He was actually involved in our story before, being wounded at Wilson's Creek, commanding a contingent of regulars. Despite this combat experience, he was inexperienced in commanding such a large body of men. Gilbert was actually a disciplinarian and was hated by many of his troops. Reportedly, Indiana men vowed to kill Gilbert themselves once they reached combat. Gilbert would have under him a division of troops commanded by Philip Sheridan, who was recently arrived from Grant's department, much needed reinforcements for this campaign. He also had the veteran Shupp, whose subordinate was Speed Smith Fry, one of the heroes of Mill Springs, and a native of the county Perryville sat in. McCook will have a division under Lovell Rousseau and one under James Jackson. Rousseau was born in Kentucky but moved to Indiana. He had gained experience as a volunteer in the Army during the war with Mexico. After the war, he will go into politics, but is going to change his tack once there, from radical to moderate. Rousseau has under his command John Starkweather, a former lawyer and commander of the 1st Wisconsin. He will go on to practice law after the war. Leonard Harris and William Lytle will be the other two commanders in the division. Lytle had been a veteran officer wounded at Carnifex Ferry. The other division commander, James Jackson, was a Kentucky native who reportedly resigned from his volunteer service to escape a court-martial, which is a very different story than Rousseau. Crittenden would have one under William Suey Smith, Horatio Philip Van Cleve, and Thomas John Wood. Smith was an Ohio native who had attended West Point. He will raid into the South and engage Nathan Bedford Forrest later in the war. After hostilities, he will become an engineer, building skyscrapers and bridges. Van Cleve was a Princeton, New Jersey native who would become a civil engineer prior to the war. During the war, he would be involved in Tennessee for the majority of the combat. Wood is an interesting figure, being partially blamed for disaster at Chickamauga, moving his men out of line and opening the Federals to a timely Confederate attack. He would redeem himself at Chattanooga and continue to serve during the Atlanta campaign. For the Third Corps, Gilbert had a division under him commanded by Robert Mitchell. Mitchell had come from Kansas and was a fiery officer. Under Mitchell was a brigade commanded by William Carlin, who would go on to command troops through the Atlanta campaign. Carlin had also commanded troops on the frontier prior to the Civil War, so he was a very able officer. All in all, Buell would be able to bring around 55,000 men to the field. For the Confederates, we have many familiar faces. The wings of the army were commanded by Leonidas Polk and William J. Hardee. Hardee would have a division under James Patton Anderson. Anderson had served in the Mexican-American War as a volunteer. He was in Florida at the outbreak of hostilities and would join up with Bragg during his action at Pensacola. He will be serving the Confederate cause all the way up until the surrender in North Carolina.
Also under Hardy was a brigade commanded by Daniel Adams. Adams was a Louisiana native and had practiced law before the war, unfortunately actually killing a man in a duel. Already a veteran officer, Adams had lost an eye at Shiloh. The right wing of the army was commanded by Leonidas Polk, as mentioned. His division was commanded by Frank Cheatham, who we have actually introduced, having been one of the officers who went up against Grant at Belmont. He has brigades commanded by Daniel Smith Donaldson, Alexander Peter Stewart, and George Earl Manny. The Donaldson name should sound familiar, the Tennessee native being a nephew of Andrew Jackson and the namesake for Fort Donaldson. Manny served as a volunteer during the Mexican-American War and was an extremely competent officer. Alexander Stewart was a Tennessee native who had attended the military academy before resigning. He will be in the Western Theater throughout the war. Cavalry was under command of the already mentioned Joe Wheeler, with John Wharton also playing a big part. Wheeler is a Georgia native. He was very much the opposite of Forrest, described as a more cordial officer. He was nevertheless very effective, serving throughout the war. He will go on to command troops in Cuba during the Spanish-American War, and is actually, side note, depicted in the movie Rough Riders, which is one of my favorites, albeit I think Gary Busey is a very poor choice for Joe Wheeler, and maybe one day I'll get there where I can have, if not a Patreon episode, maybe even a regular episode talking about that movie, but I'm sort of thinking that might not happen until we're completely done with our narrative here. Wharton actually commanded Texas Cavalry under Forrest during his strike on Murfreesboro. Wharton had come from the 8th Texas, or Terry's Texas Rangers. He will eventually command the cavalry under Richard Taylor during the Red River Campaign. Unfortunately, in Texas, Wharton would be killed by a fellow officer over a disagreement. During the battle, Bragg would have only around 16,000 men to bring to the field. Now, Bragg and his army had set up at a place called Bardstown. Bardstown being southeast of Louisville and west of Frankfurt and Lexington. It was also close to a small town called Perryville, which had been named after the 1812 naval hero Oliver Hazard Perry, being one of the first settlements in Kentucky. It was here that Bragg had planned on uniting his forces with Kirby Smith. Kirby Smith, unfortunately, had other ideas, and Bragg would have to come to him at Lexington. Remember, it had been decided that once Bragg and Smith met, it would be Bragg who was going to take command. Joseph Morgan, whom Smith had given the slip at Cumberland Gap, was advancing, and he would wish to meet him, having been bolstered by Humphrey Marshall's 3,000 men. Good news for Bragg would be he would receive reinforcement in the form of Claiborne's brigade, as well as that of Preston Smith, who was a Kentucky native and key to the recruitment of Kentucky men to the Southern cause. So far, Bragg was surprised and frustrated, not only by the lack of cooperation by Smith, but also the lack of new recruits into the army. It is interesting to point out, and I think I mentioned this in a previous episode, that Bragg was expecting there to be something like 15,000 men clamoring to join the cause. Even after the lukewarm original reception, there was prevailing theory that if the Confederacy would win their next battle, then it was possible to still gain some support. The Union government in the state had passed a law stating that for anyone joining the Confederacy, it would make their property forfeit. So if you were a horse farmer, or even more ironically a slaveholder, then you were probably not too keen on joining up without a solidified Confederate presence. Otherwise, it could lead to 
for you to be ruined financially. There was also emphasis to make sure a Confederate governor was inaugurated. Once he was able to take his seat in Frankfurt, then there could be enforcement of the Conscription Act, so then there would be, for sure, numbers added to the Army of Mississippi. As you can imagine, being conscripted into the Army is also probably not high on the priority list of the citizens of Kentucky. The contrast between Bragg and Lee is interesting here. Lee did not realistically expect there to be a whole lot of volunteers coming his way from Maryland. In fact, as mentioned, he was doubtful he would see any. To Braxton's defense, John Hunt Morgan had reported previously that there would be an influx in recruiting, and it is likely in my mind this false report would be yet another reason why Morgan was in the doghouse. Morgan actually does get most of the recruits that they find in Kentucky. They end up joining the cavalry, so he ends up having more men under his command, but that doesn't necessarily help Braxton Bragg. If Jeb Stewart had raided into Maryland and reported that there was going to be legions of Marylanders who would join the Army of Northern Virginia, would Lee have believed him? We will never know, but it's an interesting question. Now, the lack of available water was an issue for both armies, as we have previously highlighted. The fall of 1862 was one of the driest on record for Kentucky. Perryville, it should be noted, was one of the few towns in the area that still had a good supply of water, making it fairly important. Buell would finally start moving his forces out to meet Bragg on October 1st. There would be a feint towards Smith and Frankfurt, using only a single division, while the bulk of the army would be moving on Bardstown. From there, they could advance on Harrodsburg, which was a key junction and supply depot. Bragg would grow concerned that there would be a large force going to meet Smith. His troops would retreat from Bardstown, using cavalry from Joe Wheeler to screen the withdrawal. Buell's army would move slowly, of course hindered by the water situation. Along the way, there was a famous incident with Buell, who would chastise soldiers foraging for food. An altercation would occur, causing Buell to fall from his mount. This did nothing to help Buell, who was already on thin ice with officers and men of the army. It is unfortunate, though, because Buell has a pretty good idea of how he wants the campaign to unfold. Ideally, he will threaten the rebel supply base at Camp Dick Robinson. This would force his enemy, hopefully, out of Kentucky. His movements were to hopefully draw the Southerners away from this position. Bragg, in the meantime, will be continually disappointed by Smith, who would not unite forces. Smith had enjoyed being an independent commander way too much. I think we all know that person, and it may be a variety of different work situations, that definitely likes to go rogue and doesn't really enjoy being supervised, even if it's necessary for the success of the business. So we can definitely categorize Smith as one of these individuals. Relishing in being his own boss, Smith would use the excuse that he would need to meet the threat posed by the Union forces coming from the South. He had known far earlier that there was only a division that had fainted at Frankfurt, telling Bragg too late. Bragg wants to combine all his forces so that there could be a big showdown battle for the state he is looking for. Without Smith, it's going to be extremely difficult. The new Confederate line had Hardee's contingent setting up at Perryville, with Polk's forces being able to support if necessary. The heavy Federal demonstration to the front of Hardee worried the old general. He advised Bragg not to divide the forces. If the threat was at Perryville, concentrate there. If it was elsewhere, send the troops to that location. 
Wheeler's cavalry sprung a trap on the 7th, hitting the Federal cavalry and inflicting casualties upon the blue-clad riders. There was a lot of pressure, Wheeler being forced to fall back. It was clear that the Union Army was there, ready to hit the rebels at Perryville. Both sides would bed down to notably good weather that night, unsure of what was going to happen the next day. Key to understanding the Confederate strategy was the thinking that they needed to withdraw across the Kentucky River and set up a new defensive line there. This would be more appropriate given Smith's men and their location at Lexington. Versailles was on the eastern side of that river, thus Bragg was thinking it would be good to set up there. Polk was coming down with his men in order to swiftly deal with what Bragg surmised to be the inferior force so that his combined troops could move back to face the real enemy attack. Perryville, of course, has the Chaplin River running by the town. The rolling hills that surrounded this area lends to the battle's second, less popular name of Chaplin Hills. Terrain in this battle is going to be important. High ground would be used to the Federal advantage, and at times it can also mask a rebel attack. Water is also important, with Doctor's Creek to the south. Two major roads would cut through the battlefield, the Mackville Road running to the south, and the Benton Road running roughly to the north. They would meet near the Russell House at the Dixville Crossroad. This dwelling would be used as McCook for his headquarters. Two houses, the Widow Bottom and the Squire Bottom House, were on the southern part of the field, close to the Chaplin River. Of course, I want to add a map to the website so that we are probably more clear. Wilson's Creek was the first battle we heard about there being an acoustic shadow. Perryville 2, there is going to be an acoustic shadow. And wind is it even going to blow away the smoke. This is going to lead to Buell being in the dark about what is happening, as well as Corps Commander Gilbert, who was at his headquarters. Union officers had the night before gathered in a conference to petition President Lincoln to remove Don Carlos Buell from command of the army. Unfortunately, this is going to be a little late, and it's going to be Buell at the helm for the impending battle. On the night of October 7th, there would be one key event that would start off the Battle of Perryville. Confederates under St. John Little would occupy some high ground that overlooked a small body of water. Remember that water was scarce. Gilbert's corps would be directly across from Little and his brigade of Arkansas troops. Specifically, the 7th Arkansas was on the high ground. Dan McCook would be tasked with moving his brigade forward and reconnoitering the position, taking the high ground if possible. On the night of the 7th, there would be sporadic fire between the Green Regiment of McCook and the veteran Arkansas men. McCook, of course, was one of the fighting McCooks and had recently lost his brother. His troops would perform well during the night skirmishing and be in a good position to jump the Confederates on the next day. Despite these developments, the Confederates would do very little. It was plain this would be the location of some kind of Union activity on the next day. High ground would be taken, with Little's men being pushed back into the trees. Cavalry would support McCook's men, using Colt repeating rifles to keep the Confederates at bay. Phil Sheridan was observing the attack, and is actually going to disobey orders by sending in a brigade of his veterans. These men were fresh from the Army of the Southwest, having fought at Pea Ridge. They would engage with Little's full brigade, who's going to stop the Federal movement near the Bottoms House. It was plain to both sides that reinforcements would be needed. 
Lovell Rousseau would be the first to arrive on the field to form what would become the main Union battle line for McCook's Corps. It's actually going to be McCook's Corps who's going to do most of the fighting on the pleasant October day. Gilbert, as we have mentioned, was with Buell at his headquarters and not present on the field. Crennenton's Corps would be marching from the south, but encounter cavalry under Joe Wheeler. Crennenton and Thomas would not push through this screen, perhaps Thomas feeling the strain of almost having replaced Buell a short while before. Wheeler, on the other hand, did not inform Bragg that there was a sizable enemy force approaching, so there is a variety of errors on both sides. Back on the northern part of the field, Jackson's division would form up and be jumbled with Rousseau's, just based off the terrain. Rousseau would observe there would be dust moving in the distance. Despite an artillery duel that displayed the superiority of the Federal rifled cannon, there was little other evidence of the rebels being present for an assault. At least it seemed that way to the general officers. Buell was convinced that the Confederates were retreating, and that a pursuit would be better left for the next day. Any Confederate artillery was simply covering their withdrawal. I have seen a major criticism of Buell being that he was much like McClellan, and that he did not react appropriately when faced with deviations to his overall strategy. Pope also had this issue, in that he was convinced the enemy would sit and let his plans play out perfectly. Perfectionist as a way to describe Buell? Maybe. Inflexible as another way to describe him? I think so. Dust on the horizon was not actually the Confederates retreating, but rather, this was Cheatham's division moving to the right of the southern line. Bragg had arrived on the scene and realized that his position was weak on the right near a place called Walker's Bend. On a map, this was a straightforward move, but it was actually a tough march, and of course the dry weather made the dust noticeable. Bragg's plan was for Polk's men to attack in echelon, with Hardy supporting from the left. Spoiler alert for December, but Bragg really likes this kind of attack, and he's going to do it again at Stone's River, so he's sort of a one-trick pony in that regard. Polk, though, was concerned by cavalry reports from Wharton that the Union troops were moving down from the north and would be in a good position to flank him if he began the attack. Already, he had adopted an offensive-defensive strategy not attacking and defying Bragg's wishes. Polk's deficiency as a wing commander was fully on display. When Cheatham finally got into place, it would be Donaldson's and Manny's brigades who would lead the assault. Donaldson would actually mistakenly move his men straight into the center of the Federal line, the use of terrain by the Yankees allowing for a deadly crossfire. Just based off the way in which McCook's corps had set up, it would be William Terrell's brigade, which would be hit first by these attackers. Terrell, we have actually mentioned before. He was a Virginia native who had attended West Point, getting into a fight with Phil Sheridan, resulting in the suspension for a year of Sheridan. Terrell had commanded a battery at Shiloh, performing well enough to be given a promotion commanding a brigade of mostly green troops. He would also have under his command a battery, which he would stubbornly defend. Donaldson's brigade would be attacking through the center as mentioned, led by the 16th and 15th Tennessee. Cheatham would realize the error in sending the first way into the middle, turning to Manny and his brigades, who would move to take the batteries under fire and flank the enemy position. These regiments would be able to use the train to their advantage, whereas the 16th and 15th would take casualties from accurate artillery fire. Terrell's guns would be seized, the Federal general committing two of his regiments to ill-fated bayonet charges, the 105th Ohio taking heavy losses in the process. James Jackson would be killed at this point in the fight, 
as a new defensive position was taken by a brigade under John Starkweather. Assaulting this new line would be Hardy's men, who would begin their attack led by a Mississippi brigade under Thomas Jones, which is going to shatter, taking them out of the fight completely. Bushrod Johnson would attack after the decimation of Jones's command, but he would be stymied by Lytle's brigade of Rousseau's division. Meanwhile, near the Squire Bottom House, high ground near Doctor's Creek would allow for the Union infantry to hold off Confederates with a steady rate of fire. On the Union left flank, there would be a renewed assault on Starkweather's line by Manny's Tennessee regiments. Eventually, they would be supported by an additional brigade under command of Alexander Stewart. Stewart was able to relieve the battered regiments in Donaldson's command. It would be this assault near the Wilkerson House that would see the toughest fighting of the battle. Starkweather would have two batteries under Captains Bush and Stone, which would be the target of the Confederates. These units would be supported by infantry. The 21st Wisconsin would attempt to stop the advance of the Butternut Regiments, but they would take on heavy casualties in a cornfield before the main line of Starkweather. Rousseau apparently had a grudge against these unruly badgers, whose ranks were full of harder line abolitionists. Manny's regiments, led by the 1st Tennessee, which had gone through the first assault, relatively unscathed, would smash into the new line. The whole time Starkweather was concerned that his current position was less strong than a position he could potentially withdraw to. Rousseau had commanded him to move up to the new line. Starkweather, though, would start to move his cannon back to the original line in which he decided was a better defensive position. Some men of the 1st Wisconsin actually had Henry repeating rifles, which would be key to the repulse of the Tennessee men. Hand-to-hand fighting would erupt over the cannon, with heavy casualties being sustained on both sides. In fact, each of the three remaining regiments for Starkweather's brigade, the 79th Pennsylvania, 24th Illinois, and 1st Wisconsin, would suffer 50% casualties as would the 1st Tennessee. William Terrell would move to take command of the situation, wanting to step in for the killed Jackson. It would reportedly be while jumping in to serve on an artillery gun crew that he would be mortally wounded. Terrell was unable to resist jumping into the artillery, as he had already commanded a battery mentioned at Shiloh. Once Starkweather pulls back, the action in the sector was over, with both sides having suffered greatly in what I have been described as possibly some of the fiercest fighting of the war. Importantly, the Federals have been forced to refuse their line, bending but not breaking when faced with the mostly Tennessee troops. On the southern part of the line, Lytle's brigade was holding fast, but soon would be faced by Adams's brigade, as well as Claiborne's, advancing near the Squire Bottom House. These regiments had actually captured some Union uniforms, possibly Munfordville or Richmond, and were wearing their spoils, leading to their targeting by their own artillery. Once this had ceased, Claiborne would set up a plan. He would not attack the Federal line directly, but he would try to make sure that they were convinced his skirmish line was actually the main body of his brigade. The Union troops would pour fire at the skirmishers flying the flags of the regiments, freeing up the main battle line to smash in and break Lytle. Adams and his regiments had been dubbed cowards at Shiloh, so the Louisiana men were also wanting to make a statement. They would tear into the 15th Kentucky and 3rd Ohio regiments. Lytle and his men were pushed back further to the Dixville Crossroads. This was the position that we mentioned where the Mackville and Benton roads met. If this position was to be taken by the Confederates, it could cut the Federal Army in half. 
Lido would actually be wounded and captured by the attacking enemy. Claiborne and Adams would be unable to follow up on this success, with the new Union line solidifying and some units from Gilbert's command being thrown to stop the attack. Ultimately, the terrain and the Federal artillery discouraged any kind of continuing the fight. Leonard Harris's brigade would hold, along with George Webster. Webster would actually be killed in the latter stage of the battle, faced with Sterling Wood's brigade, trying to take the key position. While all of these assaults were going on, Phil Sheridan was frustratingly stationary. He was concerned that his position would be assaulted much in the same way as McCook's corps. Samuel Powell's brigade would attack an artillery position of Sheridan's, not knowing that there was infantry there to support them. It was believed falsely that these pieces were anchoring the end of the Yankee line. Powell's Confederates would find out the hard way when receiving heavy fire from infantry supports. Sheridan was not going to follow up on his successful repulse of the rebels, despite pleadings by Dan McCook to shift and support his brother's corps. Later in the day, Gilbert arrived on the scene, probably still unaware of the battle until he reached the front. He would be able to support McCook and rein in some of his more bold commanders. Robert Mitchell's division was moving up to take the town of Perryville. One of his brigades, under William Carlin, actually reached the outskirts of the city, having pushed Powell's men to the far side of the Chaplin River. Preston Smith's brigade, the only reserve, would arrive on the scene and solidify the situation. Mitchell would argue that an assault could not only take the city, but also cut off the retreat for the Army of Mississippi. This is definitely one of the major what-ifs of the battle, and there's several on both sides for the Confederates. There's missed opportunity. Polk doesn't jump off his attack immediately, right? Um, there is some shifting around of units, maybe. What if Kirby Smith had been there? There's all kinds of what-ifs for the Confederates. On the Union side, it's what if there had been a more competent corps commander whose name was not Charles Gilbert on the southern part of their line. What if Gilbert had actually been present? Maybe things would have been different also. But they definitely could have broken Bragg right here in Kentucky. At this point in the fighting, it may have been too tall a task to attack Smith and dislodge him. There was also a lack of available sunlight, which would hinder the Union cause. Regardless, Gilbert was not willing to try. St. John Little's brigade will be thrown in, having done very little fighting since the morning. They would approach the Dixville crossroads, two brigades from Gilbert having been allowed to shift and plug the gap between the two corps, as well as relieve the battered first corps men. One brigade was under Colonel Michael Gooding of Mitchell's division. During some exchanges in fire, Bishop Polk would ride forward in the darkness and actually converse with men from the 22nd Indiana, believing that these men were Confederates. The general spoke with Colonel Squire Keith of this regiment, telling the Federals to cease firing as they were shooting at their own men. A darker coat in the dim light would save the bishop and a staff officer from being detected. Polk would ride away after realizing his mistake. Little's Arkansas men would unleash a terrible fire into the Indiana men, the Hoosiers taking some 65% casualties, the heaviest loss in the battle. This area is now known as the Slaughter Pen. Little would be pulled back by Polk, though, obviously shaken at the near mishap in the darkness. The Battle of Perryville was over. Union casualties were 4,211 compared to 3,401 for the Confederates. That night, Bragg would hold a council of war. Polk and Hardy were in good spirits, following their strong actions against McCook's corps. It was apparent to Bragg, though, that this was not just a small portion of the Army of the Ohio, and it was in fact the main contingent. Kirby Smith was not with him, so he resolved to combine forces in Harrodsburg. 
From there, they would protect the key supply area at Camp Dick Robinson. Rank and file troops were not pleased to be giving the field to the enemy. Now we can kind of think about how the average Confederate soldier who had participated in the fighting would have felt. To them, they had performed extremely well. They had pushed the Union line back. And it's not till you take a wider view that you realize that almost an entire corps was not engaged and that they're greatly outnumbered. So in many ways, Bragg is lucky to even be able to escape. Amazingly, Buell would not pursue Bragg as he slipped away. When his subordinate officers reported on the action, he did not believe some of them. Once he finally came to his senses, Buell would still wish to roll out his original plan of attack, showing this inflexibility yet again. Due to poor communication, the Army of the Mississippi would be allowed to escape. Eventually, they would make their way to Camp Dick Robinson, Kirby Smith's army fighting a brief delaying action at Harrodsburg, so that they can also get credit on the Confederate book report that was the action around Perryville. Bragg would suffer from supply problems, and the Union Army was about to be reinforced by additional troops under Gordon Granger. Louisville was also able to resupply Buell, which meant the enemy would be fresh. Additionally, news had arrived that Price and Van Dorn had been defeated, leading to a decision to withdraw. The rebels were allowed to return to Tennessee. Buell would take a march in the direction of Nashville, wanting to protect that city rather than chase his opponent. We mentioned in a previous episode here how Andrew Johnson is the governor of federal Tennessee, and he wants to make sure Nashville is protected, so Buell marches in that direction rather than try to destroy Bragg which is the problem when you have a lot of these generals who are very heavily involved in the political arena. This would end the Heartland Campaign of 1862. Let's call it a day right there. Today, we fought the Battle of Perryville, which is often overlooked when it comes to the major battles of the war. Next week, we are going to have an episode to breathe. We'll have some smaller scale actions out in the West, and also be able to go back and fully discuss the significance of Antietam. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show would be greatly appreciated. Feedback is always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.